All right. Good day, everybody. This is Jim Ledoux here at the Warning Decision Training Division. And with me is uh, Jill Hardy, also with WDTD. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest here. And I do want to welcome you to our Storm of the Month series, which is kind of like a, there's an embedded mini series called Users of the DAT. And for today, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Christine Standahar Alfano, who's a senior forensics engineer and also Director of Forensics Meteorology at Hague Engineering. And Christine uh, has been a long-time user of the DAT. I've known her for some number of years through the activities of our Standards Committee at ASE on wind speed estimation. And uh, Christine, you have a uh, dual degree. It's basically meteorology and engineering. And apparently, Hague Engineer, uh, the firm, loves to have dual degree people in both of those degrees. So if you are ever interested, they are looking. There are not too many dual engineer and meteorologists out there. But anyway, she's going to talk about users of the DAT and forensics evaluations and some of the things, for example, that Hague Engineering does, which uh, may be quite representative of users of the DAT in the private sector. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak a little bit about some of the forensic evaluations that we do. And I'm going to talk briefly on an introduction to building performance because I suspect that most of the people that are in attendance are probably meteorologists and not engineers. So just to give you a kind of a brief overview, building performance is really dictated by two main variables. You have the load that the building or structure is going to experience. And that can be just the weight of the building materials. It could be a wind load. It could be snow load. But there's variable loads that it's going to experience. And in order for a building to perform adequately, it needs to be able to resist those loads. And so that resistance comes in two forms. First is that the building materials just need to be strong enough to withstand the loading that it's experienced. And that comes from a strength standpoint. But another form of resistance that is less known or maybe less talked about is what we refer to as serviceability. And what that means is that when a building is subjected to loading, we don't want it to have excessive deflections. So if you think about a traditional wood framed home, if that building moves a lot from wind, for example, and the walls deflect, the building itself structurally may be sound. You're not going to have any considerable damage to the building frame. But when you look on the inside, you'll see damage to your brittle interior finishes. And that includes your drywall, baseboards, crown molding, things of like that. And so it's not really what people think of traditionally for failure. But that in particular case, you've exceeded your deflection limits and caused damage inside. But overall, failure occurs whenever that load exceeds the resistance, be it the serviceability or strength requirements. And this ultimately does result in a lot of questions, and that's where we get involved on the forensic side. And some of the common questions that we get is, well, why did the failure occur? Was there a particular weak point in the building? Are we able to identify where failure initiated? And that's where we kind of put our engineering hat on. Some other things that we get asked to look at is, was the failure the result of poor design? Or was it designed correctly, but it was just constructed inadequately? Was the building fine at the time of construction, but there's been deferred maintenance that has resulted in deterioration? Or was simply the building just past its useful service life and it's just gotten old and, you know, was no longer able to resist modern loads? And then a question that gets asked a lot is, well, ultimately, who is responsible? Who's going to pay for this damage? And that's where our background in forensics becomes pretty useful. And with Haig, we are one of the unique companies that provides forensic evaluations for both engineering and meteorologists. And our meteorologists that are on staff, their task really is to understand the hazard or the load that the building is experiencing. So this includes a review of historical weather data, and a lot of times that's just try to determine what happened at the property. Were there excessive temperatures, a lot of precipitation, were the wind speeds very strong, what direction were they coming from? And a good meteorologist needs to understand the limitations of this data and know that we're looking oftentimes for site-specific conditions, but the weather data is not always where we want it to be. 
And ultimately, what we like to do at Hague is use this meteorological data in conjunction with site inspection so that we can validate what we're seeing in the field with what we're documenting from the weather data. From the engineering side, we really need to understand the load and the resistance. And what we do when we have these evaluations is that we're studying how the building failed to determine what the cause or causes of the failure was. And while we're in field, we collect perishable data. And this could just be simply by taking photographs of damage, taking measurements. And in some cases that are particularly contentious, we may actually keep some of the building. So we may take some structural members and retain that as evidence. And so we'll store that so we can see were there any particular deficiencies that were notable that we think would be relevant to hold on to. Likewise, we need to be able to differentiate between new and old damage. So was this something that was pre-existing and someone just noticed it after the storm, or is it something that was truly related to a storm? And occasionally we'll get asked to document or determine what is the best method of repair. Will the building, is it salvageable, or does it need to actually be tore down? But in both of these cases, our engineers and meteorologists are often called as expert witness in court cases. So a lot of what we do initially may not necessarily be litigious, but it eventually goes down that path as both parties are trying to come to some type of agreement. So that brings me to the DAT specifically. And when we're doing tornado evaluations, the DAT is particularly useful because both our engineers and our meteorologists can use it. Specifically, the DIs and DODs, they give you some information on the building performance as well as the wind speed, which is giving us, okay, how is the building performed from a resistance standpoint, as well as what were the estimated wind speeds, which is a load standpoint. Another really nice feature of the DAT is that the weather service teams, the survey teams, they're out there usually a day or two after the event, and so they're taking some photographs really before any major cleanup has occurred. Whereas by the time that Hague gets involved, sometimes we're several weeks to months after the event. And by that point, a lot of the damage has been cleaned up. And so the DAT is able to really store some of this perishable information that isn't necessarily there when we're on site. And so it is pretty useful, but it does have its limitations. And so I'll kind of show you some case examples in the next couple slides. So I'm gonna go over three case studies. These are all from older tornadoes because from our end at Hague, these are files that are no longer active. And so I can actually share some of this information with you. Some of the more recent storm events, I can't necessarily give you specifics on that. But the first case study that I wanna talk about was from a tornado outbreak in Southern Minnesota. It was an EF1 tornado on September 20th of 2018. So in this particular case, I was retained by my client, and in this instance, it was the insurance company, because the property owner was concerned about damage to the residents that occurred during the tornado, and their primary concern was related to the windows. So the property owner said that he started noticing condensation between the glazing of his double-pane windows, and that wasn't there prior to the tornado. But other damages at the house included, there were some doors that were blown in, debris impact marks on the side of the building, several felled trees, and then various damage to exterior cladding components. So my client specifically was like, listen, I know that there were strong winds there, but none of the window glazing was broken, so the glass itself was intact. So is it feasible that the tornado wind loads could have actually broke those seals, which caused the condensation to occur? So while I was on site, I obviously want to document overall how the building performed, and I want to see if there's a pattern that I can identify. And so the DAT in this case was pretty useful because I was able to determine where the residence was in the tornado damage path. And when I went to prep for this, I actually pulled up the DAT data again. And when I was assigned this case, the DAT had one continuous tornado damage path. However, since then, the Weather Service has split that up into two separate tornado paths. And the property that I actually looked at is no longer in either tornado path, which was actually a pretty interesting thing to me just to see how the DAT is updated and iterated. But while I was there, it was in this damage path that you can see here in the light blue. 
So for my field investigation, I identified several windows on the front and the side of the building that were fogged, but they didn't have any condensation. So that's what you can see here on the lower left. And that told me that that's an aged condition. It takes a while for that mineral accumulation to develop. And that wasn't the result of the recent tornado. I was there about two to three weeks after the fact. But on the rear of the house, I did find seven windows where there was condensation between the panes, but there was no fogging. And so that tells me that at that point, the seals had failed recently to allow environmental air in between the panes to cause the condensation. Likewise, on the rear of the building, I observed multiple windborne debris impacts, which told me that this side did experience some pretty strong winds and some windborne debris. And the windows were mostly on the upper stories, which kind of makes sense with what we know about wind profiles in that generally they increase with height and there's less friction, obviously, the further away you get from the ground surface. So then I need to kind of try to tie it together for my client. And so I pulled the DAT data relative to where the property was located. And so on the rear of the house was where I saw all of that recent condensation. And that was consistent with a southwest wind on the southern side of the tornado. So in this particular case that I was on, I was able to determine that the condensation was a new, new condition. And it was consistent with what I knew about where that building was located on the southern side of the tornado. And I was able to attribute in that case that those broken seals on the south side of the residence or on the rear side of the residence were the result of the tornado in September. So that was the first example, which was, uh, I think, probably something most people don't necessarily think about when they think about tornado damage. So the next cut case study I want to talk about was the Dallas EF3 tornado, which occurred in October of 2019. And so my purpose of work for this was that I needed to inspect 13 warehouse-style buildings that were damaged by the tornado. So my client was the property owner in this case, and he owned all 13 buildings. And he wanted to know where was the worst of the damage because he had to send his cleanup crews and his demo crews, and he wanted to get to the worst buildings first. And he also wanted me to look at those buildings first. So normally, I would go through and go, you know, A, B, C, D, I'd go sequentially. But that's not how he wanted the investigation done. At the time, I was based in Charlotte. I wasn't able just to drive down the road and get an idea of where these buildings were. And I needed to try to coordinate with my team to figure out where we were going to go and what buildings we were going to start with. So this is where the DAT was really useful for me. I knew this was going to be a multi-day inspection, and I knew I wanted to get to the worst damaged buildings first. So I used the DAT to identify buildings that were in the core of the storm and identified those as these are the ones I think are going to have the most significant damage and the ones that I need to hit first. And so when I arrived on site in Dallas, these were the buildings that I started on. And in this case, the inspection did confirm what the DAT identified, that the worst hit buildings were in the core of the tornado. And the other thing that I noted was that the failure modes were consistent with the EF2 rating that was assigned by the Weather Service. But on the southern side of the tornado, the damaged contours did miss some structural damage on a few of the buildings that I looked at. So just to give you a visualization of what this looked like, building K was kind of in the core of the tornado, and that's the picture that you can see here on the upper right. And so this particular building, we had some collapse of the exterior walls, loss of the roof covering. We had garage doors that were blown in, which resulted in internal pressurization, and some of the interior framed walls were bowed out. And so obviously a building that had much more significant damage than building D here, which is on the southern portion of the tornado. And so this is the roof of building D, and you can see that we have some windborne debris, and some of our roof-mounted HVAC units were also skewed off of their supports. But overall, this building had just minor damage to it, and so this is one of the buildings that I inspected later on in the week. So in this particular case, the DAT was really helpful for those of us that weren't at the specific site, but wanted to try to organize how we were going to do these inspections. So the last case study that I'm going to talk about was a tornado in Miami in February of 2016. And this is one that actually 
was a court case. And so I wanted to give you guys some example of how some of this information ends up in a court setting. So I was retained to review an opposing meteorologist report as well as review damage photos to determine if the structure was in fact damaged by a tornado on this date. And so in this particular case, my client wanted me as both an engineer as well as a meteorologist. And in this particular instance, I was retained around, I think it was like 2018 or 2019 when I was first hired on this job. And they didn't ask me to do a site inspection because the building had already had some repairs done, everything had been cleaned up. And so there were changes to the building that it wouldn't be worth my case going out and doing a site inspection. And so having the DAT was really helpful so that I could, one, figure out what the tornado damage path, where it was located, but also what some of that damage looked like in the tornado and to compare that with photographs taken at the property shortly after the tornado to see if there was any correlation at all. So from an engineering standpoint, I am going to look at how the building performs. And this is basically what you guys do in the weather service when you go out on the surveys. And so you're looking to see what damage is present at the building. So the only damage that was really evident in the photographs was if you see here on the right hand side, this fence had a slight lean to it. But that was really the only condition that I had observed in the photographs that was related to any type of wind forces. On the exterior of the building, there were no scuffs or gouges from windborne debris. No trees were fallen down. No windows were broken. No windows were scuffed. The roof membrane itself was intact. It was, this is a low slope roof, so it wasn't peeled back or flipped back. There was really no indication at all that this building had any damage from wind. So I then had to go and be a meteorologist in this case. So I reviewed the applicable weather data. And I saw that the property itself was under a tornado warning beginning at 7.53 in the morning and was canceled a little after 8 o'clock in the morning. And the National Weather Service in Miami confirmed that an EF1 tornado did in fact occur while the tornado warning was active. But the survey found that the tornado itself was about 3.78 miles long, had a peak width of 150 yards, and the estimated wind speeds obviously fell within the EF1 rating of 86 to 110 miles an hour. And so, okay, I knew that in this particular case, there were some strong winds associated with a tornado, and I needed to figure out where that was relative to the house. And so I plotted the DAT data. This is a very zoomed in photo of some of the DAT data, as you can see here in the red box. The site that was of concern was to the north of the northernmost DAT point by about 0 0.4 miles. And so that's a pretty big distance to be away from the tornado that was identified by the Weather Service. And I actually counted 17 rows of houses between this northernmost point and the site where they were reporting tornado damage. And there was no indication by the Weather Service or any other reports that had come in on that date that any damage had occurred within that 17 rows. And that's pretty much in agreement with what I saw in the provided photographs. And I was able to determine that the residence wasn't damaged by the tornado or any other wind. Structurally, it was fine. But that fence was likely displaced by winds, but it wasn't associated with the tornadoes. It was associated with the broader squall line on that specific date. And in that case, you know, it's a little bit of splitting hairs, but it, it wasn't the tornado. And that was really what my client wanted to know, was this a tornado that did actually occur at the property? But the issue in this particular case was that the opposing meteorologist concluded that tornado damage had actually occurred at the property. And in his report, he said, well, there were tens of reports of damage on this date, all from the tornado. But the reports that he was referencing in his document were actually associated with the squall line and not with the tornado itself. So for example, he was saying, well, there was a report of a tree that was blown down 10 miles from the property. And he said, well, that was from the tornado. And in this particular case, it was not. It was clearly not related to the tornado. And he also used radar imagery to estimate that the tornado had wind speeds of 95 miles an hour at the residence. 
And so my client was struggling with this one because he wasn't sure how to handle this. We had two opposing experts that had different conclusions. And both myself and the opposing meteorologist, we both have our CCMs and we both have pretty extensive forensic meteorology experience. So how was my client able to prove that the property wasn't actually hit by this tornado? And the dat in this particular case was key to show that this didn't actually occur. And it was a nice visualization to show him and um, the jury that in this case, the Weather Service did a survey, they found a tornado, and the property wasn't in there at all. And so this was a case where it was really nice to have that engineering analysis to supplement my meteorological opinion and confirm that there was no tornado-related damage to the structure, but that wind damage to the fence was a part of the squall line, not the tornado itself. So that was were kind of three case studies just to show you how the DAT has been used in forensic evaluations, and I hope you can see how very useful it is for us in the private sector. And in cases where we have to present this to either our clients or to a jury, it really gives us a nice, powerful graphic. And that is really, really nice when you have a non-technical audience. But there are some limitations that I have addressed, and in my experience, something that would be helpful for me and other people who do these evaluations, is that those EF contours are very, very useful. But there's really no explanation on how these are generated. So when I'm in a deposition or I'm on the stand and someone asks me, well, how was this generated? I don't have a good answer for that. And so it would be really helpful just to get a better understanding of how that is so that it bolsters our credibility. If, you know, when you're sitting on a stand and you keep answering, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, it makes you look like you're not very intelligent. And so having that information be, would be really, really nice. Additionally, I have done work across the country, and so there's not a lot of consistency amongst some of the offices. And the biggest thing is that there's not a good variation sometimes in the DODs and the DIs, especially when a tornado hits a densely populated area. So for example, on one tornado that I worked on, the National Weather Service had a tornado in a densely populated area, and they just documented trees as their DIs even though there was homes and businesses that they could have used as a DI as well. And trees can be a bit subjective. We know it depends on tree health, soil moisture, if there were leaves or not. And so it would have been nice for them to have documented maybe the nearby house or nearby commercial building so that we could have just that variation. But overall, I really do love the DAT. It is something that I rely on. I have taught all of our engineers where they can find the DAT and how to use it. And kudos to you guys in the Weather Service for doing those surveys and, and getting that information out there. It's, it's very useful for us in the private sector. So at this time, um, I'm going to wrap up. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. And if you're interested in getting an engineering degree or a meteorology degree and getting that dual background, please let me know. Thank you again, Christine, and thank you all for participating today.